This, uh, we will be uh, starting with Dr. Peter Hartley, who is the chairman of the economics department at Rice. He is going to talk about um, some scenarios that we ran in our world gas trade model. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is um, a joint work with Ken Medlock, who's sitting up the back, and uh, also mentioned on the first slide is Jill Nesbitt, who's one of our uh, graduate students who uh, helped us out with some of the um, uh, econometric and statistical work that underlies the model. Uh, what we've been uh, trying to do in uh, the Baker Institute is, de is develop uh, an economic model, um, or model based on, on economic uh, foundations and geological foundations. Uh, a model of the world gas market. And uh, the idea behind this model, uh, I mean, to put this in the context of all the discussion we've had so far today, uh, is not to say that uh, politics is irrelevant to uh, how uh, the world market for gas may develop, but rather uh, the idea is that economics and geology uh, to some extent set the uh, limits and also the opportunities for players in the world market. So as we've seen in a lot of the discussions, there's been a lot of discussion about the geological facts. Uh, and also though, it's not just a matter of geology, it's also a matter of economics. How do you exploit those resources, get them to market and so on? So important factor is how many resources you have and where they're located and so on, but also uh, the economics also places some limitations on uh, what you can do with those resources. Uh, and then the idea behind our modelling effort is, though, not just to, even though we begin and, and use our foundation, geology and economics, we don't end there. We then uh, want to use the model to investigate uh, various scenarios. Uh, and we have in mind uh, various uh, relevant uh, political, so what we hope might be relevant political scenarios, and uh, try to talk about uh, what, are the, what are the consequences of some of these political uh, interventions and also what are some of the limitations associated with some of those interventions. Uh, the other point about this discussion I'm going to have this afternoon is, is that uh, the paper focuses as a, the sort of after the colon some implications for Japan. So in light of the fact that uh, you know, this is a joint project with our friends from PEC and Japan, uh, our analysis uh, in this particular paper focuses a lot on, on uh, implications for J Japan in particular although this model can be used for looking at uh, a much wider uh, range of uh, issues. Um, the, uh, those of you who were at the seminar in, uh, in June in, in Tokyo, uh, we'd already talked a bit about uh, this basic model. So I'm going to basically, I'm going to go through the model fairly quickly uh, because a lot of you have seen, uh, seen these details, but the slides I think will be, will be available on the web. So you can go back and look at them a bit, bit more carefully to see some of the detail, those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, what I do want to do in, in uh, going through this, though, a little bit is to just sort of emphasise what we've done since June. So we have uh, put a lot of work into the model since then in uh, various dimensions, particularly on the supply side. Uh, in terms of talking about uh, Japan, the focus on Japan in particular, um, the, the, of course the, the big story uh, today is that Japan has been uh, the main market for LNG. But uh, the point of our model is it suggests that Japan is going to increasingly face competition from other countries uh, for LNG. Um, in particular, so sort of in the immediate term, South Korea is, has, uh, is developing as a, a com competitor for Japan for LNG. But um, uh, what's happening in, around the world actually is that the demand for gas as a form of energy, primary uh, fuel, has, uh, has increased. And that's led to a big increase in demand for gas uh, in, in all the developed countries. Uh, and on, you combine that with the fact that in North America and Europe, um, that uh, we're starting to, um, to get into the situation where it's much more expensive to, to uh, produce gas in the, the properties in uh, North America and the provinces in North America and uh, Western Europe. Uh, that means that we combine the increase, large increase in demand with uh, the fact that it's becoming more expensive to, to exploit domestic resources, 
And uh, that implies that uh, North America and possibly also Europe will become much bigger importers of LNG in the future and provide competition for Japan. Uh, and then uh, we've got the issue that was just discussed with China, uh, the growth in uh, economic growth in China and the big increase in energy demand in China uh, is also going to, to increase the demand for natural gas in particular and already China has begun importing LNG. And of course India is the other one that people don't talk about so much but India's population is projected to overtake that of China uh, by some authorities anyway, uh, by uh, the 20 teens. So, uh, and India also has started importing LNG. Uh, so, for all these reasons, uh, we expect Japan, Japan should expect to face increasing competition for, for LNG, and that's an important sort of context for our model. Uh, here's some bit more uh, uh, discussion of those points. So, uh, you can see from this, this graph that uh, the natural gas is the red sector on these pictures. So the share of natural gas has been growing as the overall demand for, for energy has gone up. And part of that's related to technological change, part of it's related to environmental pressure for cleaner fuels, um, and uh, I guess they're the two, two major factors. Um, and the, the fact that we've got this big increase in demand for natural gas raises the question where's the supply going to come from, and uh, one of the obvious uh, places to look is Russia. And Russia could be a big supplier of uh, gas to both uh, Europe and Asia, as we've just been discussing, the pipelines could go either way. Uh, and uh, what happens in Russia is actually critical to uh, Japan, um, given its interest also in importing gas. So uh, what we want to do is look at this potential relationship between uh, Russia and Northeast Asia more generally, Japan in particular, in the area of gas trade, but in the context of a world where there's a, a worldwide increase in the demand for gas and we're moving to a worldwide market. And we're, doing, we're going to look at these, sort of, these issues in the context of this, uh, tr what we call the Rice World Gas Trade Model, where, which is a model that uh, calculates prices, equilibrium pr prices to equate supply and demand in different locations in different time periods, building from geological fundamentals and economic fundamentals. So we have economic fundamentals uh, underlying the demand economic under fundamentals underline the costs, and uh, we have geological uh, data that underlies the supply side of the model as well, and the geological data comes from the USGS World Resource Assessment, plus uh, some other sources uh, that we use to, to update that. Um, as those of you who've been to Baker Institute seminars over the last few years know, uh, sort of a theme in a lot of our discussion of the gas industry in recent years has been uh, this likelihood of us moving to a much more integrated world market. And that's something that's incorporated in our model, and there's a slide there about that, but uh, for those of you who haven't seen these presentations, but uh, I'm sure those of you who've been here a number of times have heard us go through that uh, song and dance before, so <laughs> I'll move on. <laughs> um, in uh, forecasting gas demand, uh, one thing that you want to do is forecast economic growth and population growth. We don't uh, have the resources right now at the Baker Institute, and nor necessarily is that our sort of idea to develop a whole model of the world economy of how the, the world uh, economic growth is going to go and, and population growth. So instead, what we basically did is start from uh, the work from the uh, EIA uh, uh, branch of the US uh, Department of Energy, uh, used what they call their reference case for how they expect um, population growth and economic growth to influence the demand for natural gas. But then we did our own work to build in some elasticities, some response of demand to changes in prices, both of gas, oil, and, and also coal. Uh, on top of that, we built into the model a, a possibility of switching to backstop technology uh, in order to do any sort of forecasting model which is forward-looking. Uh, you have to take some sort of uh, stand on what you think is going to happen at some time in the future. So in any sort of uh, resource exploitation problem, uh, you never exploit all the resources. Uh, there's always, and there's always some alternative backstop somewhere in the future. So the optimal policy right now, how much of the resource should you take out of the ground today, uh, rather than leave it in the ground and get an alternative price for it tomorrow, depends on what you think is going to happen to prices down the track. So always in one of these sorts of models, uh, people have got to make some forecast if they're going to try to 
uh, decide how much gas or oil or coal to produce right now, have to have some idea of what's going to happen to prices in the longer term because that influences policy today. And uh, so we have to take a stand on uh, what we think the backstop technologies might be. And uh, we looked at the literature on uh, coal gasification in the short term as an alternative to, to gas. In the longer term, of course, um, you know, Ken and I have also done some work on, on uh, renewables. And ultimately, of course, the, the, economy, the world economy has to transition to some kind of renewable energy resource if economic growth is going to continue. Uh, so uh, in this setup, we, we, we have a very simple specification of the backstop. But one needs to make some kind of assumption about what the alternative is going to be in the long run. Uh, going to the supply side, as I mentioned, we used uh, USGS approved uh, natural gas reserves, updated with some more recent information. And we also have, the USGS also has undiscovered natural gas reserves. Uh, when we updated the approved reserves, uh, what we did actually was um, moved, oops, moved uh, reserves between the undiscovered to the proved. So if we increase the proved, we de decrease the undiscovered, right? So the, in the sense that some of the un yet to be discovered resources then became uh, discovered. So uh, using that data, we also have not just data on the likely quantity of those reserves, actually we use what's called the P50 or the median estimate, which is uh, so what the USGS actually gives us is a probability distribution of the likely future finds in each geological uh, province. Uh, rather than take the whole, so you want to convert that to a single number, we use the median number, so we take the level of reserves, likely level reserves, is such that about half reserves will be above and half below. Um, in addition to the median level of reserves, uh, they give us information on the, the mean depth, the minimum depth, and the maximum depth of the resources. Using that data and relating it back to US data, we developed costs. So this is something we've done since the uh, June seminar. Actually, we spent a lot of work on the cost side and improved a lot, we think, uh, the cost estimates of uh, how much it's likely to cost to exploit these different resources around the world. And here's an example of uh, sort of the cost curves that you get. So this is uh, the capital cost of um, producing uh, uh, reserves in, or producing approved reserves in Alaska, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and here's Western Siberia. And you can see on this picture, there's uh, trillions of cubic feet along this axis, exactly how huge Western Siberian reserves are, or potential reserves are, relative to uh, the rest of the world. Other places that are thought to be large. There's just an enormous amounts of gas. Uh, to, the USGS, at least, believes there's enormous amounts of gas to be found in, in Russia. Uh, in the model, we also take account of technological change possibilities. We all know there's been a lot of technological, ch some discussion today about uh, uh, 3D technology, uh, new technologies for in the mining industry. Uh, we are using the, um, uh, this is from the National Petroleum Council, we adapted their technological change assumptions to, to our setup. Um, in addition to, on the supply side then, so we've got the supply side and the demand side, we also have to put together the transport routes. This is a picture from the US Geological Survey. The uh, red here is where the, the, uh, the big gas deposits are, the purple is the lesser gas deposits and so on. That's where the gas is. Uh, these lights are where we've got to get it to. Uh, and so you can see that uh, where the lights are on is not necessarily where the gas is. So you have to have transport links uh, linking those uh, two parts of the, the globe, or those different parts of the globe. And uh, we allow in the model for transport links to be built, uh, both pipe, new pipeline projects and uh, LNG uh, shipping routes. And uh, the model basically chooses uh, these routes to minimise the cost. Um, here's an example. You start with a pipeline network like this, and we, we simplify it, aggregate them. On the uh, LNG side, uh, we also aggregate the shipping routes into a hub and spoke framework, kind of like the US airlines use. And, uh, and then we've done a lot of econometric work as well on trying to estimate the cost of these pipelines, relating it to the characteristics of the area the pipeline's going to cross. And similarly, on the LNG side, uh, we estimated costs of shipping, uh, regasification, and liquefaction. Using uh, there's a lot of econometric work has gone into developing all these cost estimates. There's some more detail in the paper. Uh, here's a table of indicative costs. Uh, we also built into the paper some uh, technological change assumptions on the LNG side. 
An important factor in leading to this idea that the world gas market is going to become much more integrated is a fall in, in shipping costs in LNG. Uh, the assumptions we take came from the World Energy Investment Outlook. Um, then uh, put all this together, uh, what the model does is it solves for prices at a whole range of locations around the world to equate supply and demand, solves for uh, new transport links, and uh, does this for every two years, explicitly up to the time horizon here is 2040, although the model, as I said, goes beyond that in, in its solution uh, technique, but explicitly uh, up to 2040. Uh, and uh, what we've graphed here is what the model says about uh, dollars per MCF for four locations. So the blue here is Henry Hub, uh, the red one is Tokyo, uh, gr uh, the green one is uh, Zeebrugge in uh, Western Europe in Holland, and the purple is Beijing. So we picked out four different cities, but in fact there's a price solution here for a whole range of locations all around the globe in each time period. And one thing you can see uh, interesting about this is that at the moment uh, gas prices in the US are below Tokyo, these are wholesale prices, but a model says that out in the end tail period here, the United States actually ends up being, having more expensive gas than Tokyo, and that's where at the end period the US is a big importer, or starts to import a lot of LNG, and the LNG the US is getting is coming from further away than the LNG that Japan's getting. So the United States actually ends up with, with higher gas prices. Uh, Beijing ends up here with lower. You notice also that these other three prices converge, really, as the model. So as, as, the, as you get more and more LNG in the model, going, the LNG sort of arbitrages prices around the world. So all the countries that are importing LNG, they all tend to have their prices converge. The big difference for Beijing is that it has a lot of, getting a lot of pipeline gas from Russia in the base solution. So if you just looked at the economics, of where you'd want to, where's the gas, where's the demand for it, Where's the future demand going to be? What's the cost of connecting up you know, those red areas with, the, with where the lights are on? The model says build pipelines from Russia to China. And because Beijing's getting fed by, by pipeline, it has lower, lower um, gas costs, like gas prices. Uh, here's actually the supply projections. And you can see at the start of the period, this is uh, the blue here is North America, United States, uh, Canada, and Mexico. And the red is Russia. Uh, and more or less uh, similar, perhaps North America is slightly bigger than Russia here at the beginning, but by the end you can see uh, Russian production is much, much bigger, it's by far the biggest uh, producer. And uh, this colour here is the Middle East, this is a whole, all the Middle Eastern countries uh, lumped together. So you saw on those cost curves that you know, it's, it's fairly cheap, there's a lot of fair few resources in, uh, in Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Iran, you aggregate those, that also becomes a big, big producer. Uh, South America, the, the purple here is South America, so it continues to be a big producer, but actually in the model, South America is also uh, a big source of demand. So as we'll see, uh, when we look at the export picture, it's a little different uh, to this. Uh, this one in here is Africa, so uh, particularly Nigeria and Angola, because early on in the period we've got Algeria and Libya, but toward the end uh, you've got Nigeria and, uh, and Angola are playing a much bigger role. Uh, the brown in here is, is Australia, production of LNG, uh, this is China, domestic resources. Uh, light blue is South Asia, domestic resources. And uh, this is Southeast Asia, primarily Indonesia and Malaysia, which of course are still big players. And up here, Europe, which is uh, still the North Sea area. So that's basically a summary of how the model, where the model predicts where the gas would be produced if what you want to do is produce it uh, most cheaply and get it, get it to market. On the demand side, uh, we have North American demand, and one thing you notice is North American demand tails off at the end period here. What's going on? Well, that's our backstop technology. So in the most, we point out that you, you end up with gas getting expensive in North America, and so uh, part of what happens is you have coal gasification, you have these alternative technologies being used when gas gets more expensive. Uh, another important point here is the red is internal Russian demand. Even though Russia is a very big producer, it's also a big consumer. So uh, uh, when we come in a moment to look at the export picture, you see a different picture. Here's the former Soviet Union in terms of demand. And then uh, here's China is the yellow. So you can see the growth, growth in Chinese demand. And right next to it is uh, South Asia, primarily India. So China and India are these two. And you can see toward the end of this horizon, they become very, loom very large. Uh, and uh, the light green here is, is uh, Middle East consumption. Now, a lot of that is 
is, is uh, gas being used for oil production, actually. Uh, and uh, this is South, and I mentioned South America. This is South American consumption. It's also large, so the amount they have for export is not so great. And here's European demand, which is sort of on the order of, of Russia and North America. And of course, much greater than their uh, production, so they have to import. And so here's a picture of natural gas trades by region. You have exports measured going in this direction down, imports in this direction up, and uh, Russia is, is the dark, is this red in here. So you can see that Russia becomes a very big exporter. And on the, in, in, on the import side, we can see North America as a whole becoming a big importer. And then uh, these two in here again are China and India. China and India, the next two blue, they're very big on the import side. And the one at the very top is Europe, is also a big importer. And um, this one here is Japan and South Korea primarily dominate this, this light green colour. And on the supply side, as I mentioned, Russia is a big exporter. Uh, we also have Africa here, Nigeria and Angola. Uh, this is Australia with LNG. The next one down um, is Southeast Asia, primarily Indonesia and Malaysia. And this one's the Middle East. And uh, if we look more carefully at LNG in particular, these are the LNG exporters broken down here by basin. So here's the Atlantic Basin, the Middle East, and the Pacific. And this one in here is Australia and then uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. They're very big uh, producers of LNG. They're exporting to the, to the Asian markets uh, toward the end of this period. And uh, in the middle, here's the middle, here's the Middle East. And then Africa is also um, particularly Algeria, Angola, and then uh, uh, Egypt and Libya so on the top. Uh, LNG importers, we've got uh, here's uh, the US, uh, here's Canada is right down the bottom, the United States. This is Baja, California, it's listed as Mexico, but primarily, of course, this is gas that's going up to California. So the United States is the sum of the two reds. Pink is, is Mexico on its own. Mexico's going to predictably become a big LNG importer. The blues are different countries in Europe, and the greens are the Asian countries. And this one in here, let's see, this is um, India, China. Uh, Japan, and then uh, South Korea, Taiwan. So Japan is the bright green. So if over at the beginning of this period, Japan is the biggest importer of LNG. By the time we get out to the end, you can see the, how it's dominated by China, India, and uh, North America. And again, in North America, it tails off at the end partly because of the backstop. The same thing happens in Japan. Notice how the bright green gets smaller at the end because also Japan also switches to this uh, backstop technology because it's expensive gas as well. Focusing on Japan in particular, uh, one thing the model says is that uh, there will be a pipeline built, or it's economic to build a pipeline from Sakhalin to, to northern Japan. So that's this dark red colour. Uh, but the rest of the supply in Japan comes from LNG. The reason is it's very, very expensive to build a pipeline, national pipeline grid within Japan. So the, the pipeline gas only penetrates down a certain distance. The rest of it is still uh, um, served by LNG. And this is on the demand side. And again, you can see the, the fall off in demand because of the switch to, to backstop. OK, so that's the basic reference case model. What we really wanted to do was to use the model to, um, I don't know how much, where's my timekeeper? She seems to have gone, I guess. <laughs> Someone's keeping track of my time for me. Uh, we wanted to use the model, put the model through the paces by uh, running various scenarios. And given what's been said this morning, it's not surprising that uh, one of the first scenarios we, we look at is reduced Russian supply. And I think there are any number of reasons why there might be uh, reduced Russian supply. Uh, one of them, two of them have been talked about, export tax on, on, uh, Russian, on natural gas, and another one would be internal Russian politics that might discourage investment. And yet another case may be a deliberate effort on the part of the Russian government to try to restrict supply to raise prices. Um, the second experiment we looked at was, and again, given the previous discussion, uh, talked about whether, as I mentioned, the model builds pipelines to China and Korea from Russia, and also, actually it turns out, there's a pipeline built from Vietnam to southern China. Uh, and politics might mean that these don't, projects don't go ahead, as we just, just heard. So the experiment is, if you don't build these pipelines, what happens? Uh, we also saw the role of the Sakhalin pipeline in Japan. What happens if that's not built? And then we also have two, these are all supply side scenarios, we have two demand side scenarios. Suppose you have higher Ch Chinese growth or higher Japanese growth. Okay, so the first one was, uh, what happens if we delay Russian development? 
Uh, so uh, we, we end up, of course, with um, uh, less Russian production. And you can see up here, the world as a whole uh, ends up with uh, nine TCF less being produced in 2040 because of higher prices. Uh, the demand for gas falls in our model because of this uh, elasticity. And, uh, but you notice that this fall in pipeline gas is more than uh, LNG. In fact, LNG actually increases slightly. So part of what happens if Russia restricts supply is that some of the alternative supply comes on as LNG. And indeed, you can see in the short run, actually, uh, it's Southeast Asia and Australia here, which had the big positive in these middle decades. A big positive increase in supply, uh, but in the longer term we see uh, Africa and the Middle East coming in as, as being uh, positive, right? and also to some extent in Asia. So if Russia tries to restrict supply, they're successful in doing that as long as they don't do it too much. Actually, the earlier run we did, we uh, had Russia restrict supply in an effort to double its rate of return and, and we found that it couldn't do it, basically couldn't happen. So there's a limit on how much they can restrict supply and raise uh, uh, earn monopoly rents. And the restrictions are, first of all, there are alternative support sources of supply. But secondly, we've got this backstop technology. And as uh, prices rise, people switch out of using natural gas. Uh, what is the consequence of a uh, restriction on Russian exports? We've summarized in this picture what happens to prices. So the first, the red here, is Henry Hub. This is US prices. Uh, the second one is European prices, and that's the purple. Uh, the green is Tokyo, and the blue is Beijing. So we see that the, if Russia were to restrict supply, the biggest impact is in China, because China's getting all this uh, supply, in the base case, getting all the supply from Russia via pipeline. Uh, but it also has an impact in, in Japan, and the impact in Northeast Asia is much greater than the impacts in, uh, in Europe and North America. And uh, if we look over here, we can see, uh, you know, this is uh, reflecting the prices, this is what happens to demands. The biggest fall in demand you can see here is China, Japan and Korea, they're the biggest negatives. Uh, and the former Soviet Union, and of course there's some negative impact within Russia itself. Prices are wholesale prices are higher in Russia if you have less production in Russia. And here you can see what happens to, to Russian gas if uh, Russia reduces its output uh, then um, own use actually goes up unless of this gas is shipped out by pipeline to Europe, less is shipped out to, to South Korea and so on. Actually, you notice that the fall in Russian exports to Europe is greater than the fall in Russian exports to Northeast Asia, but the price rise is higher in Asia. That's because Europe has more alternatives closer at hand. Whereas in uh, Northeast Asia, they, they get less supply from Russia, they've got to bring it from further afield, so it has a much bigger impact. Uh, we can also, uh, we looked at the story, suppose these pipelines aren't built, so you don't have this pipeline connecting uh, Russia with China. What ends up happening, again, it's a very similar kind of story. You can see down here, the model says we want to produce a lot more LNG. Actually, the total LNG goes up. We want to produce a lot more LNG, particularly in Southeast Asia area in the short run. Uh, and then in the longer term, um, it, actually with the pipeline not being built, an interesting thing that happens here is that Russia itself gets into uh, a lot more LNG. So uh, Russia starts exporting some of its gas as LNG. Uh, and another interesting thing that happens is if you look at the pipeline shipments, uh, uh, if we look at what's happening to Europe, there's a big positive uh, thing here. So if Russia gas can't get out to uh, Asia through pipelines, what ends up happening is, I, I forgot to mention actually, in the base case, what the model does is it connects West Siberian gas, actually all the way, it takes some West Siberian gas to China at the end of, end of the period. Uh, if you restrict those Chinese pipelines, what ends up happening actually is that East Siberian gas goes West to Europe. So uh, European, Russian exports to Europe actually go up. This is the biggest uh, positive, 0.23 here. So the gas, you want to get the gas out somewhere, uh, and uh, that's, that's what happens. So if you look at this, actually in Europe, you see here at the end of the period, prices actually fall if you cut out these pipelines to China because there's a huge rise in prices or in, in relatively speaking in Beijing but also prices in Tokyo go up uh, and uh, as well as European prices falling to some extent uh, North American prices fall with Pimi Um and then if we uh, looked at the compare that with the um, Sakhalin pipe not being built uh, that's going to have a bigger impact on Japan Actually, if we, if we look at this, the green here is the Tokyo. So you can see that now, instead of the Beijing prices being most affected, it's the Tokyo price, obviously. So restricted 
but the story is you still get some uh, negative impact um, uh, in, in Europe here with the Z broker and uh, to some extent in uh, one well, US right at the beginning. Of this. So again, uh, Russian gas, you have a lot of it going to Europe by a pipeline, big fall on the amount of going to Japan. Uh, then we looked at two demand growth scenarios. Uh, suppose you have, so we have two of them, we have higher Chinese growth and we have higher Japanese growth. Similar kind of story that uh, in the um, higher Chinese growth case, at least early on in the period, you get big price increases in Beijing. But again, Tokyo unfortunately feels Japan gets the spillover effect. So part of the story in all of this is anything that affects the development of Northeast Asia, or the relations between Russia and Northeast Asia, uh, affects actually all the Northeast Asian countries together. There are these sort of spillover effects. It's an interesting lesson for, from the point of view of uh, thinking about Japanese policy. That, uh, policies here that favour sales of Russian gas to China actually benefit Japan, and conversely, po policies that disadvantage Russian, or Russian sales of gas to China actually also disadvantage uh, Japan. Uh, so in this case, um, we have, if you have an increase in uh, Chinese demand, uh, go back to the side, we get a, a, an increase in total world production, and it's actually both pipeline and LNG. Uh, again, the, the marginal sources of LNG are the same ones that, that expand. Uh, and on the uh, pipeline side, we can see that you have a much bigger pull on Russian supplies. And again, uh, uh, Russia, gets, Russia gets in. Well, no, actually, Russia, with Chinese growth, you get this extra pipeline uh, being built to China, extra pipeline gas going to China, and Russia actually does less LNG. Uh, similarly, um, with the Japanese case, uh, again, uh, world demand increases, world supply increases, but toward the end of the period now, overall world production of gas actually falls a little bit because Japan now actually ships, transfers, or moves much more heavily into the backstop technology. Uh, and uh, again, you get a uh, big pull on LNG. Summarising uh, some of the implications of our basic, basic model. Uh, first of all, Russia becomes a major force in the global gas market. Uh, Russian pipeline gas continues to be very important for Europe. But in the model, if you look at the economics of, and where the, ga where the gas is and where the demand is, uh, the model says that Russia will also become a major supplier of natural gas to Northeast Asia. Uh, Japan continues, however, to import LNG, and sources of LNG remain important for Japan. Uh, ultimately, as I said a minute ago, uh, gas is piped from West Siberia East in this model to supply Asian markets. Uh, and then Russia also enters the LNG market, possibly supplying the US, so that Russia then becomes a pivotal point for the pricing of gas throughout the world. It's actually exporting in all three directions. Another interesting thing that happens, though, is the Trans-Saharan pipeline gets built from the 2020s, so you have uh, Nigerian gas going up to Europe. Uh, India also, in the model, eventually imports Iranian gas via pipeline through Pakistan, and that's another interesting thing. Would that happen in, in practice? <laughs> so it's another one of the experiments we, we intend to do, look at. What happens if you prevent that? Uh, but because India is also importing LNG, so basically what happens, would, would, we predict what will happen is that India will substitute out a pipeline gas into LNG and it won't have a, a big effect. Uh, another point I made, North America becomes a major importer. Alaska does not save the United States, uh, but it, uh, Alaskan gas basically serves to replace declines in other North American production. It doesn't have a dramatic impact on prices. Gas prices in the US eventually exceed prices in Japan. Uh, South American gas is consumed primarily in South America. There's a big increase in production, but there's also a big increase in demand in particular from Brazil and Argentina. So they don't really also come in as a major supplier in the Western Hemisphere to the rest of the Western Hemisphere. Some of the implications of our sensitivity cases, variations in the demand growth in Northeast Asia have dramatic effects on global gas markets. Higher growth pulls harder on both LNG and Russian pipe. Uh, higher LNG demand has a spillover effect for the United States. Uh, these different pipeline flows can have different spillover effects too. You, you have more pipeline gas Going to Asia, it affects prices in Europe and vice versa. Uh, the Russian ability to exploit its monopoly power in, in gas, however, is limited, both by the fact that there are alternative suppliers out there and there's this backstop uh, resource that can uh, limit its ability to raise prices in the long run. Um, the ability of Middle Eastern producer cartel to exploit its monopoly power is also limited. I didn't report it here, but we did another experiment where we looked at 
What happens if the Middle East tries to restrict supply? And of course, then what happens is Russia expands. Russia in the former Soviet Union expands much more to, to fill the gap. Uh, political constraints on the development of pipeline routes in Northeast Asia raised demand for LNG in particular, but also eventually pushed Eastern Siberian gas into European markets. Uh, it's an example of what we can do with, with the model. Different. I think we should do the questions now while okay. it's fresh in people's minds. So does anybody have a uh, question? Uh, price tags, were they uh, nominal or real? That's real. Yeah. So that's uh, all that's 2002 prices. We're using the reference case for uh, EIA, is that correct? Yeah, the basic uh, demand growth, absent any price changes. So, and the EIA uh, data case that we use is based on population growth and economic growth for the rest of the world. Uh, they have an assumed price path, price path for the United States. What we did was uh, translated that assumed price path to the rest of the world using uh, the transport cost differentials, uh, and then set base demand growth. If prices were to equal those, that uh, reference case uh, price scenario, the demand would also equal the EIA reference case demand. But then we, we have price elasticities built into the model. So that the, our, our demand will adjust to price changes, and that's all part of the solution. There's a dynamic response to any price changes that represents substitution basically uh, over the estimation period, primarily between gas and coal, I guess in the electricity sector, uh, would be the main thing. Just, just to be sure, sure I understand, Dr. Harder, when you do your sensitivity, yeah. There's really no is there a link back to the general economy. If you see the price change, no. the, that's where. Yeah, no. So, so uh, uh, a more general equilibrium uh, setup would uh, say when pr energy prices go up, that that will impact economic growth and uh, reduce demand in that way. Uh, that's not explicitly allowed for in our analysis. However. Uh, the price elasticities that we derived, uh, you know, we did we derived econometrically. So uh, we're using OECD countries, and so those substitution or those that, that reduction in demand following uh, price increases, real uh, price increases, in the data actually reflects both substitution between fuels and also uh, reduced demand for fuels as a result of impacts on growth. So I mean, uh, that's sort of would be in, we didn't purge the econometric estimates of that. So I guess in that sense there is, there would be some feedback. So, so one thing that gives us the, the size of the elasticity we've got is that probably some feedback, that's all. Dr. Hartley, why does uh, Europe not see a decrease in demand in the long term as the US and uh, Japan? Japan. Uh, they do, uh, there is some back movement uh, toward backstop technology, but it's less than in the United States. It takes longer before that comes in. And basically the reason is uh, Europe is a lot close, is really, you know, in the end closer to uh, more sources of pipeline. More of Europe is being supplied by pipeline. So, so basically what's happening in the model is, is um, the LNG moving around is, is equilibrating prices, um, up the transport costs. So places on the coast basically are going to have prices that are related to each other because of the, the you know, North America's buying LNG, Japan's buying LNG, China's buying LNG, India's buying, all those places. But once you get to the interior of the continents where the places are served by pipelines, it's also true in the US, by the way, once you get to the interior of continents where, where there's some pipeline supply, those prices can be lower than, uh, than the prices on the coast. But, but in your base case, the European price eventually uh, surpassed Henry Hub. Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, in the base case, no, no, no. Okay. no. So, yeah. Uh, I think this is right. Somewhere in the, in your summary, you said that talking about South American gas, Trinidad was a short term. Mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Whether there's some implications that. Right. It's not worrisome. Yeah. Sort of yeah, so Tr Trinidad uh, is a supplier to, to North America of LNG, but it, it, um, in the model, it basically goes through to about 2020, and then it, it, it dwindles as a source of LNG. The US is going to be importing LNG from elsewhere. Of course, a big big area would be um, in Nigeria and Angola, so 
lot coming from Africa. But, uh, and what happens is there's a lot of natural gas in Venezuela, but the, the, the thing in the model, the, 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 what the model says is that the Brazil is going to become a big demand of, of natural gas. It's also a, a big economy, a growing economy. It has domestic resources, but the re domestic resources are very expensive, quite expensive to exploit, relatively expensive to exploit. So what the model does is build pipeline network in South America. So it, it, Brazil starts pulling gas from, from Venezuela, also from Bolivia, and, uh, and Argentina is also a uh, fairly big demand. In fact, at the end of the, the modeling period, Argentina imports LNG. So uh, we have some exports of LNG from South America from uh, of Bolivian gas going from the West Coast. But we also have imports of LNG uh, on the East Coast of South America, again, probably uh, primarily coming from, from Africa. Well, is, is it is this it then the Trinidad just peaks out in its capability in about 2020? Relatively, relative to the demands and relative to supplies from elsewhere and so on, it, it doesn't, it's not a big player. It continues to supply, but it, it, it's, you know, it doesn't, uh, it's not a saviour, just like Alaskan gas is not a saviour either. Right, right, I understand. Were you able to isolate Canada in any way? Yeah, we, we can separate off, so I, and one of the pictures I, I showed yeah, you can, I mean, can but, how did you see it playing out? You know, with most of the gas staying in Canada in support of, of oil sands projects, or were some left over to ship down to the U.S.? Well, we haven't um, sort of studied that in detail. We can pull all that out. I mean, actually, it did take a little bit of effort because a lot yeah. of the pipelines crossing backwards and forwards across the border. Mm -hmm. So you have to sit down, and, and, uh, and some of the, some of the pipes are going uh, shipping gas north, and some are shipping south, and some go into Canada and back. You know, and so on. So you have to sit down and pull that out. Um, we haven't done all that, so. Uh, but Canada again, um, uh, you know, part of the story of the Alaskan gas is that, is that the Western Canadian uh, uh, production, right, the ability of Western Canada to supply the U.S. declines, and Alaskan gas kind of replaces Canadian gas. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yes. Uh, my understanding why the pipeline from Russia to China was not built is uh, the discrepancy of price, gas price. And Russia wants to sell it at the $75 per 1,000 cubic meters, uh -huh. and China wants to buy that at uh, 25 or 30. So th there's no, uh, uh, there's no building your trade. Now, actually, in our reference case, the, the gas pipeline is built from Russia to China. So, so in the in the basic case, so if you just look at the economics of it. Uh, what the model is saying is, is uh, uh, not only should you build the pipeline uh, from uh, East Siberia, first of all from East Siberia to, to Beijing, but also uh, ultimately uh, that pipeline network is connected up with West Siberia. And so both Asia and Europe draw on West Siberian reserves. So in the base case, that, that pipeline is built and China is served by pipeline from Russia. But uh, what we did was, as an uh, experiment, mm. we said, suppose uh, the Russian and Chinese governments can't come to an agreement. Mm. And suppose that the pipeline is not built. What are the consequences? So it was a political yes. experiment. Yes. But the, China is buying their own domestic gas from oh, yes. Xinjiang Uyghur, uh, yes. Shanghai. That is $150 per uh, 1,000 oh. cubic meters. Uh -huh. So very expensive uh -huh. uh, domestic gas and uh -huh. very cheap for Russian gas. So there must be some confusion about the gas price policy in China. Ah, uh, well, actually, our model. See, we we don't. Um, you know, we look at the resource characteristics and how much it would cost to exploit those resources using best practice technology. How much it would cost to transport the gas and so on. And what our model says is that you, is that China should exploit some domestic resources, and in fact, they do build an internal pipeline. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, get some gas from the west. Now, part of the story here may be that, though, that where the model starts. Okay, when we start the model, we build the existing infrastructure. So it could be that China made a silly decision to invest in a pipeline, right? And so if, if the pipeline had not been there, maybe the model wouldn't have built it. But given it's already there, it's cheap to use it, right? So, so existing uh, pipeline infrastructure, we, 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 we put in the model. And then only from now on out, from 2004 out, does the model only build pipelines and, and transport routes and that are economic. But, but we do start with the existing infrastructure, so there can be some. So part of the reason why China may exploit a lot of its domestic resources early on could be because the Chinese government policy said, 
put in a pipeline where the economics didn't make any sense. But, you know, that's sort of water under the bridge. We take that as given. Given the pipelines are there, it's actually optimal for, Japan, for China to use it in the short run before it draws on Russian gas. So you mean after the pipe, pipe was constructed, everything would be going on uh, and rationally? Yes. <laughs> but yes, that's what the modest assumption of the model. Except when we do explicit experiments where we say, okay, this is what the model says is economically rational given the, you know, given the economics and the geology. Then we can ask the question, what might happen that is overrides the economics? And what are the consequences? And I gave you some experiments, because the number of experiments is endless, right? So we can talk about a whole lot of, quote, irrational, irrational things. We can say, what happens if another pipeline is subsidized? You know, that will have implications. So I mean, you, you can start to specify all kinds of, of overrides to the model. But the, but the logic of the model is to say, given where we are now, how would the world develop you know, based on economics and geology alone? But what China is doing now is make a block against Russia, but in, in, there's a lot of demand, uh, demand growth in, yeah. inside, so they expand LNG import. Yes. It's very nonsense, economically nonsense behavior. I can hardly believe that. Well, actually, our model says give, given the existing infrastructure, uh, China would be an LNG importer. It would, it would actually import more LNG. So. I mean, uh, so even though you, you bring in pipeline gas to northern China, uh, some of the big markets, uh, you know, uh, Guangdong and so forth, you still import LNG. Not only southern part of that, but northern part. Yeah, our model wouldn't say you want to do that. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm now going to uh, uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, you will see when, his, when the slides come up, we uh, send our condolences to uh, Mr. Marita, who couldn't be with us here today um, because of a death in his family. And so I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Kenji Kobayashi, who is a researcher also at the Institute of Energy Economics in Japan. Uh, hello, I'm Yoshikazu Kobayashi of the Institute of Energy Economics, Japan. Uh, before starting my presentation, I'd like to express my greatest pleasure to the um, uh, Baker Institute for Public Policy and Petroleum Energy Center for Japan for allowing, allowing, allowing me to participate in this uh, workshop. Uh, this presentation is divided into three parts. First, I will review the natural gas demand in Asia, and then I will explain the importance of Asian gas market for Russia. And then I will discuss the second implications on the Asian energy, energy market. Uh, let me start with the broad picture. This is um, estimated by our institution. Um, as you know very well, Asia will dramatically increase the uh, primary energy demand for the next 20 years, and its average annual growth rate is by far the largest of all the other regions. Let's skip this. Uh, this is the world primary energy demand by fuel. Oil will stay the largest energy source in primary energy mix. Can I get back? Did you want to use the uh, you want to use the arrow? Okay. Yes, it would be here. How can I get back? You want to go uh, backwards? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this is the world primary energy demand by fuel. Uh, oil will stay the largest energy source in primary energy mix by 2020. Natural gas, on the other hand. It's expected to grow with its future extensive use in various sectors and then eventually catch up with coal. Uh, this is world gas demand by region. Although Asia will stay the third largest uh, gas consumer in the world as a region, its share will grow dramatically for the next 20 years. 
and its annual growth rate is also the largest uh, of all other regions, also in this sector. Uh, let's focus to the Asia. Um, you can see how large uh, the China impact is. China will double its primary energy demand for the next 20 years, and uh, its uh, share will also jump from the current 38% to the 45% in 2020. This is primary energy de demand by fuel in Asia. Coal and oil are the, uh, the major energy sources in this sector, in this region. But, um, but uh, reflecting the demand growth in the power generation sector, the natural gas demand will also dramatically increase by 2020. Uh, this is a comparison of primary energy shares by fuel between world and Asia only. Uh, if you look at the uh, left graph, you can see that the coal and natural gas shares are converging toward the same level in 2020. But in Asia, however, although the downward trend of coal and the upward trend of natural gas is the same as the world graph, but their shares have still wide, wide gap. So we can say that the natural gas, in, natural gas demand in Asia will, uh, will have a significant growth potential for the, in the long run, for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, this is Asian gas demand by country. Uh, China impact is large also here. Uh, because of the growing demand for power generation, municipal gas use, and its environmental advantages, the, uh, the gas demand in China will increase substantially. Uh, let's skip this graph. Uh, this slide shows the trading patterns of natural gas in its quantity. In the world, the amount of air energy trade is only one third of the total pipeline traded amount. In Niger, however, the amount of LNG, LNG trade is more than nine times of the pipeline traded amount. Uh, this is primarily because in this region, production and consumption are geographically re remote, and the pipeline infrastructure has been historically underdeveloped. Uh, this is air energy demand and supply forecast in Asia Pacific region by our institution. Uh, figures might be too small for you, but um, what I like to highlight here is the sum of existing and coming capacities of liquefaction facilities is smaller than the forecasted demand in 2015. So it means at least some of the uh, planned capacities for the liquefaction facilities must be on stream by 2015 or almost within the next 10 years. Uh, let's move on to the second part. Uh, this table is telling some well-known facts, such as uh, the former Soviet Union is the second largest natural gas reserve holder, and Asia Pacific is the second largest natural gas importer, only after Europe. This slide shows the relationship between the Russian economy and its oil and gas sector. The Russian economy has been booming since 2000, the growing oil and gas, re gas export re revenues contribute to this uh, economic growth. The oil and gas are responsible for 53% of total export values in 2002. The oil and gas sector, therefore, has a vital importance for the Putin administration.
Uh, this is a gas export to OECD countries, um, uh, mainly to European countries such as Italy, Germany, France, and Austria. Um, gas exports to these countries have stagnated. Large expansion of export to these countries to break through this situation is being planned, but liberalization in the European gas market has made this region gas, future gas demand uncertain. Russia also exported its gas to CIS countries. The exports to these countries, however, has not increased since the collapse of the former Soviet Union. And it is not expected to show uh, uh, large growth in the near future. So the bottom line is, to increase its gas revenues, Russia has to develop a new export destination. These are energy projects which are ongoing and expected in eastern Russia. In the fast box, for the Sakhalin 1 and Sakhalin 2, permanent facilities for the oil and gas production and transportation are now under development. Now under development. In the second box, as previously discussed in the earlier sessions, the Trans-Siberian oil pipeline <coughs> from the East to Siberia is now uh, finalizing its project plan. As you may know, Japan and China are competing over the final destination of this pipeline network, this pipeline networks, either to Dachin, supported by Chinese, or the Nakotoka, supported by Japanese. The Russian government has not made any official decision over which option to take first, but it is expected they will decide later this year or maybe earlier months in next year. In the third box, we have a broad vision of the Northeast Asian gas pipeline system. This project aims to develop the gas pipeline network from Sakhalin to both China and Japan, and then connect the network to the, uh, the Kovikta Korean Peninsula Pipeline Network, which is also now uh, discussed among the Russian, Chinese, and Korean governments. By linking these areas, uh, Japan, China, Korea as consumers, and Kovikta, Sakhalin as large gas producers, more flexible and thus economical gas trade operations will be available, will be feasible. Uh, what if all these projects become materialized? Under the current high oil and gas price environment, we estimate the export value from this energy project will exceed 39 billion US dollars per year. So um, it is no doubt that these projects have solid economic attractiveness. As a summary of the second part, uh, I'd like to repeat the following points. The oil and gas sector has a vital importance for the Putin administration. Gas exports from Russia has not increased for years. Liberalization of the European gas market has made the region's future demand uncertain. To increase its export revenues, Russia needs to find a new export destination. Abandoned gas reserves exist in Russia, including Sakhalin, but this local demand in these regions is limited because of smaller population and no large industries. But if you look at farther east, there is a big LNG demand in Asia. So the Asian gas market is becoming more important for Russia. Uh, let's move on to the third part. So where is Sakhalin, by the way? Sakhalin Island is offshore the, uh, the far eastern Russia. And uh, the Sakhalin 1 and Sakhalin 2 project are in the northeastern part of the island. Uh, 
Uh, this is an overview of the second one project. The project operator is ExxonMobil, and its partners are Japanese Sodico, Indian ONGC, and Russian Rosneft. Um, although the initial cargo of the crude oil is, is to be loaded next year, 2005, um, its gas export plan has not been finalized yet. This is because this uh, consortium prefers to export its natural gas by a pipeline. But the talks of this pipeline construction had stalled among this project of potential gas buyers and possibly the um, Japanese government. So um, this project has not been able to find any way to export its natural gas so far. Uh, what about Sakhalin 2 project? The project operator is Royal Dutch Shell, and the partners are Japanese Mitsui and Mitsubishi. Um, the initial export cargo of crude oil is to be loaded in 2006, and the initial export cargo of the LNG is uh, to be loaded in 2007. The biggest difference between the, the Sakhalin 1 and Sakhalin 2 project is whether to use LNG or not. Um, in fact, uh, this project have already agreed with some Japanese LNG buyers in gas and power sectors. And possibly they plan to export the LNG to Korea China, or possibly to uh, the U.S. West Coast. Um, the Sakhalin project has several significant, significant aspects on Asian LNG market. The first one is uh, its large reserves and geographical proximity. Um, with this geographical uh, proximity, uh, Northeast Asian gas buyers such as Japanese or Korean can utilize it as uh, something like uh, a largest uh, storage tank with which they can operate more flexible on-demand delivery services to meet demand fluctuation. This is a similar operation uh, as the, uh, what the U.S. Gulf refiners are doing with the Venezuelan or Mexican oil. And um, in this aspect, uh, the buyers can also expect a large amount of inventory holding cost reduction, too. Uh, the second significant as aspect is somewhat related to the first one, but um, uh, thanks to this shorter distance, as shown in the map, um, energy buyers can not only save a large amount of transportation cost reduction, but also they can enhance the energy supply securities by diversifying their sub gas supply sources from politically unstable and geographically remote Middle East or Indonesia. Uh, the third significant aspect of the Sakhalin project it is lower capital cost. Uh, this chart shows the, uh, the capital cost of several LNG projects held by Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, this um, pale blue bar shows the capital cost of the Sakhalin 2. You can see that the, the Sakhalin 2's uh, capital cost is almost half of the left end pale uh, green bar which shows the capital cost of the, of the Australian Northwest Shelf. Um, this lower capital cost leads to the fourth significant aspect, competitive price. Um, it is reported that the Sakhalin 2 project have agreed a much lower price than other equivalent energy contract by as much as 20%. This lower contract price has a significant meaning for the Asian LNG buyers because it provides them 
more bargaining power to negotiate with the other LNG suppliers such as uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Qatar. Uh, as summary of the third part, I will state the following points. Russia is an alternative supply source for Asia with a large amount of gas reserves and good geographical locations. LNG supply from Sakhalin will contribute to energy security for Asian countries. Um, geographical proximity leads to supply stability and contributes to supply cost reduction. The Sakhalin II has great merit in reducing supply costs in terms of liquefaction process and transportation. More competitive price level from the Sakhalin II gives LNG buyers a bargaining power against existing suppliers. Um, as conclusion of my presentation, I'd like to highlight the following three points. The first, the gas sector continues to have a vital importance for the Putin administration. The importance of Asian energy market will become greater for Russia. Second, the presence of Sakhalin natural gas is becoming more significant for Asian energy market because of its impact on supply and demand balance, energy security, and competitive prices. And the third, third uh, mutual reliance and cooperation between the Russian gas sector and the Asian energy market will be more and more important in the future. Uh, thank you for the listening. Instructions in its forecast. Where would the next tranches of LNG supply come from after Sakhalin? What would be the order of priority in terms of which region you would uh, get the LNG from? Uh, you know, each nuclear power plant has its, its own uh, age. So um, I cannot say uh, if there is a big, you know, breakthrough in the energy supply into the Japanese market, but. Um, it surely has, has to happen, but the, the things will not happen in the LNG. They can, the Japanese power company can also export coal and oil. And it's especially, um, um, we have a big scandal in the, in the Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, I think two years ago. But in, in the time, the TEPCO's uh, nuclear power plant was forced to shut down to make overhaul inspection. But in the, t in the time, the oil-fired uh, oil power plant will be uh, uh, max was maximize its operation, and um, we did not actually have a big problem. So um, things will not happen only in the natural gas, but um, the, Jap the Japanese power company will also increase the import of coal and oil. Hi. Even if, if Japan get the, gets the uh, the Sakhalin pipeline, does it have does it have the um, the necessary national infrastructure to absorb the natural gas or the LNG? Well, um, obviously the uh, operation cost of the pipeline is cheaper, so that the Japanese gas gas company, the power company, will welcome its you know pipeline construction only if it is built by someone else, or maybe by Exxon or Japanese government. But um, I think now several LNG, LNG terminals are under construction in Japan so that we do not necessarily uh, need a pipeline uh, from Sakhalin. But maybe uh, Mr. Motomura has additional comments. <laughs> There's still some argument between the people. Most of energy companies don't want to have a such a trunk line pipeline system because they already had their own territory in the region. So, and the, the trunk line pipeline will, will break, will make an, will change the market system completely. So there will be another competition that comes out. But some uh, lawmakers try to build uh, 
um, such a trunk pipeline. And some say uh, construction companies are very much interested in it. Uh, so uh, the, there isn't, so, so two sections uh, competing each other. But um, the, is there any decision to make it LNG from Sakhalin 1? Well, Sakhalin 2 is obviously. But one now. I mean, we're still looking mm -hmm. at the old market. Yeah. <laughs> you said that the Sahani one for energy. Uh, actually, uh, this is a mistake. Yeah. I <laughs> won't. Mm -hmm. Well, anyways, there's still a negotiation. The, uh, to what extent, for all this to work, does it require the resolution of the problem between Japan and the four islands that Russia took after World War II? Uh, that's a good question. Um, in my understanding, Russia utilized those four island issues as a diplomatic card to draw the uh, more development plan from Japan. And um, in my understanding, um, we have four island issues, but um, Japanese government um, does not really uh, want to solve it, you know. Um, um, I, I cannot, I cannot just figure it no, for anything. There's, but, there's, uh, a, there's a greater discussion of that issue. There are two papers as you're walking out. One is by Dr. Ivanov uh, of Irina, and then there's a paper by uh, Ms. Savina. Uh, who also addressed this question. So this is more an economics presentation, but the political papers uh, are out on the table when you walk out. Politics sometimes affects economics. Yeah, no <laughs> it's just a different next, uh, next spring, uh, President Putin runs to uh, with Japan. So uh, maybe uh, that uh, uh, topics uh, on uh, Hoa Island will be very one of the most important uh, uh, subject at that time, maybe, I, I think. And uh, so anyway, at uh, that time, there's some, let's just say, um, something about the roadmap or something like that will be discussed. But no one knows what will happen at this time. Um, I'm curious about your assumption that because of deregulation in Europe that demand there for Russian gas will be flat. I mean, I, I would quarrel with that a little bit just because the projections of decreasing production in Europe are so dramatic that even if demand doesn't rise, I don't see how deregulation alone is going to eliminate any Yeah, I didn't, for mean, I didn't mean that the demand will be, will be flat. It's become more uncertain, but you know, if you look at West, demand is uncertain, demand growth is uncertain, but if you look at East, demand growth is more certain. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to move on to uh, thank you very much. Well, Dr. Saligo has the very challenging task of being the uh, closing speaker, and he is going to talk about the stubborn Asian crude oil premium and uh, whether or not the Russian oil will be enough to remove it. Thanks. Well, it's been a long day, and uh, my presentation is going to be mercifully short, short so uh, we can uh, be on schedule. Which button do I push to get the slides? Is this here? Uh, no, don't, don't push that. That changes the height. Oh, there just there. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, several years ago, Amy and I uh, worked on or did a couple of papers on what's the so-called Asian premium. Uh, here is the um, data on uh, the difference in the FOB price uh, at the port of loading in Saudi Arabia for shipments to uh, um, Asia versus Far East versus Europe. Uh, the price to uh, Asia, of course, being higher than the price of uh, 
the same oil from the same, the same port being shipped off to um, Europe. So uh, this um, difference in price, as I say, it's a price not in the final market, but at the port of loading in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we analyzed at that time as a, an example of a classic price discrimination and pointed out that there are certain conditions that must exist for a, a firm or a country to price discriminate. It must be able to uh, segment its market into uh, distinct uh, markets that have different uh, price sensitivity, to, uh, different price elasticities of demand, uh, sensitivities uh, of demand to various uh, prices. And um, it also had to prevent uh, arbitrage, it had to prevent uh, people from buying in the, uh, with the low price and selling it in the market at the high price. In other words, what would prevent a ship leaving Saudi Arabia destined to Europe to turn around and hightail it off to Asia and collect that extra $1 a barrel, that average dollar premium. And the way that Saudi Arabia has, has been able to do that is through this uh, process of destination pricing under the uh, contracts that are signed uh, by the buyers, um, you pay a price depending on the destination. There are several, very, relatively few companies that uh, are involved in exporting Saudi uh, crude. It's, they've agreed to abide by these uh, agreements so that because they're into a, in a long-term relationship with uh, the Saudis. And so in part, they enforce the uh, destination pricing. Uh, we also point out in the paper, and I won't go, go into it here, but uh, that there are very uh, few alternative um, uh, suppliers within the uh, Middle East that could undermine uh, the price discrimination by the Saudis. That is to say, some of the smaller countries like the UAE, Oman, <clears throat> are already shipping most of their oil to um, the Asian market. Um, other countries like Iran uh, has some problems with the uh, uh, because of, of um, U.S. sanctions to ship uh, more oil to Asia, but also they might very well be um, uh, tacitly uh, participating, because they're certainly benefiting from the um, Saudi price discrimination. Uh, the only way that the price discrimination could be undermined was, would be as if oil were to come in from another area, such as the Atlantic market, West Africa is what we suggest here, but that, of course, uh, is at a cost disadvantage because of transportation costs and also uh, because it's a different quality than uh, a higher quality. It also sells at a higher price. Many of the um, refineries in Asia have already been uh, long since outfitted with the necessary equipment to process the heavier, sour uh, crudes of the Middle East. <clears throat> um, so what we were going to, the purpose, I guess Amy's gone here, the function of our paper, uh, was to ask the question whether uh, the increase in output and exports from uh, Russia, the former Soviet Union, was uh, going to change the uh, change the the, the this discriminatory prices. Could this could these extra supplies somehow or other interfere with the Saudis' ability to uh, to maintain this system? Here, I've just uh, put down some numbers from the uh, IEA on uh, their projections on uh, net imports. This is sort of uh, consumption minus uh, domestic production for these various areas. Uh, I prefer to look actually at the change in the net imports, because it seems to me the diagram is, or the picture is a little easier to see. So let me just go to the next slide. Um, there you see uh, what the uh, IEA was uh, forecasting for the period 2000-2010 uh, and 2010 to 2020. Um, it, uh, despite uh, the recent uh, news stories about the um, rapid increase in demand for oil, uh, actually if you look over the period 2000 to 2003, the IEA is about right. They were predicting that uh, demand would grow at about 1.5% per annum. It grew at less than that in 2001 and 2002. Of course, in 2003, it's grown much faster. But it has averaged out, believe it or not, to about one and a half. Uh, whether, of course, this upsurge in demand, Asia is now growing, China, I should say, is growing at uh, 4%. The world demand is growing at slightly, slightly higher than 2 
Uh, whether that will continue into the future, of course, is an interesting issue. That will certainly um, vitiate the projections of the uh, IEA. <clears throat> However, I suspect the higher prices will, the IEA may turn out to be right for the wrong reasons, namely the higher price may uh, curtail the current uh, demand growth. Anyways, the point here is that um, um, if you look at that, uh, those numbers, you see that this period, uh, this decade that we're in, so say around the period of 2010, um, it looks like the um, increase in production from the transition economies or a form former civic union uh, combined with the um, other here, which is Latin America and Africa, uh, there's going to be a big increase from those two sources. And there'll be a, uh, there will still be an increase in uh, imports from uh, the Middle East, but uh, they're going to be relatively mo modest relative to what you're going to see in the subsequent period, where, of course, as following uh, presentations today, uh, Russian exports uh, are sort of uh, forecast to peak around 2010 and not grow very much in the subsequent uh, decade. So the question is that in this uh, next five, 10 years, um, are the uh, increases in production and exports from the former Soviet Union going to uh, have an impact? Is it possible, could one conceive of a situation where um, um, those imports would make it more difficult for the Saudis to uh, continue their price discrimination policy. Um, what we've done is to make look at some very optimistic forecasts for other Middle East producers, right, to see what the, the uh, potential for the Saudis uh, are in terms of increasing their exports uh, in the next, uh, over this 10-year period. Uh, these are some very optimistic um, production forecast that uh, Amy has put together. Uh, optimistic, as you'll notice, that Iran and Iraq are forecast to increase um, output by 3.8 million barrels a day. Um, the total, if these forecasts were to, be, uh, to bear out, is 3.6, which, if you look back at the, um, the EIA numbers, uh, would leave Saudis with roughly a 500,000 barrel a day increment in their exports. Remember how the uh, IEA calculates their numbers, by the way. The exports from the Middle East are really calculated as a residual. They forecast demand, they have some forecast of what non-OPEC uh, actually uh, supply will be, and then they uh, sort of compute the um, supply from the OPEC countries as a residual without really asking the question about whether, of course, the OPEC countries would be willing to uh, make up that uh, shortfall, or whether indeed they would want to produce more. Uh, it's uh, uh, sort of not a very scientific, and it's certainly not based on any model of um, the uh, supply decisions of the uh, OPEC countries. So we're going to play that game. Uh, we're going to play the game that uh, um, here's a case where the uh, non-Saudi Middle East uh, will indeed uh, potentially produce an extra 3.6 million barrels a day. Uh, we'll say that the EIA figures are right, that the total net needed uh, increase in supply from um, <clears throat> the Middle East is the uh, 4.1 uh, million barrels a day, which was on the preceding slide. That leaves, as I say, about 500,000 barrels a day only for Saudis. As I say, given the population growth in the, the Saudi Arabia, that may be an unrealistic assumption, but let's, let's play that game. So what we wanted to do, actually, was to take some extreme assumptions and just sort of say, well, okay, let's push the, push the assumptions as far as we think are reasonable, and then ask the question, um, can Saudis maintain a, a um, price uh, premium? So what we did is we just took some very extreme uh, scenarios, one where all of the incremental, uh, the incremental exports from the for former Soviet Union goes to the, what we call the Atlantic region, which is Europe plus, United, uh, plus North America. Scenario two, where indeed all the incremental FSU exports go to Asia. And then why not be uh, moderate and split the difference? Uh, scenario one actually is uh, not an unrealistic one, since, as we saw in today's presentations, 
um, much of uh, Russian export, or, uh, pol uh, export policy is oriented towards Europe, and certainly at the present time, all of the Caspian uh, export potential is directed to the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, scenario two is uh, uh, a bit far-fetched, although uh, in the sense that uh, it includes not only the Russian oil coming into Asia, but also the uh, Caspian oil. But actually, there already is about a million barrels a day of oil that is sort of leaking into the Asian market uh, from Medi the Mediterranean area through a pipeline in Israel. So it's apparently, it's already happening that some oil is backing, it's coming backwards into the Asian market from the Atlantic market. So that might be the pipeline that some of the Caspian oil or the equivalent of it would uh, come into the Asian market. Scenario three is probably the most realistic in the sense that we're, we've seen today that there are plans for pipelines uh, to be built from uh, Russia, Sakhalin, East Siberia, uh, into the Asian market, and that um, uh, possibly two million barrels a day might flow through those pipelines. And the remaining two million barrels that's uh, scheduled to come on board from the uh, former Soviet Union, mostly from the Caspian, uh, we've suggested might go to the um, European market. So what we did is, under these three scenarios, just look at what would happen to the Saudi share of the various uh, markets. And we see that um, if indeed all the uh, former Soviet Union ex additional exports uh, goes to uh, Europe, or Atlantic, Europe, United States, um, that it actually could push the Saudis out of the uh, European market. That would sort of, uh, um, the, the additional incremental supply uh, from, I might, I might point out here that these scenarios all assume that the incremental supply from um, other South America and Africa would indeed stay in the Atlantic market, would go to North America and um, Europe. Uh, so if you take that uh, increase in um, expected output plus all the additional output from the former Soviet Union, um, Probably the, uh, well, the Middle East would have to back out. And here we've assumed that indeed it's going to be the Saudis. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Saudis. It could be, of course, Iran or somebody else. But again, we're trying to make this uh, uh, sort of uh, extreme scenario just to sort of see what, uh, uh, in the worst case, or most, most extreme examples, what uh, would be the outcome. And here you see that the, uh, uh, if, if indeed the Saudis are the ones that uh, retrench from the Atlantic market, uh, their share in uh, 2010 would go down to zero. Their share in the European uh, American market would be zero. And their share in the Asian market, of course, would correspondingly go up a lot. <clears throat> uh, it's unlikely that, uh, of course, if, if they don't sell anything in the Atlantic market, then by definition, of course, there won't be any price discrimination because there'll only be one market to uh, sell their oil in. But I think it's a very unlikely case because um, uh, although in this scenario, the Saudis uh, have withdrawn from the Atlantic market. Of course, Iran, Kuwait are still exporting to the, uh, that market. And it's clearly in their interest to see that this price differential uh, continue because they're actually free riding on it. They're uh, benefiting from the higher price that the Asian buyers are uh, paying um, for the oil. So one would imagine that, uh, um, that they would not be since, since, by assumption, it's the Saudis that are able to uh, uh, maintain this price discrimination scheme, it's the Saudis that have this destination pricing mechanism at play, uh, they would certainly uh, accommodate the uh, Saudis and allow them to have sufficient shares so that they could uh, maintain this price differential. The idea here, by the way, is that the Saudis, by juggling how much oil they ship in the two markets, can uh, affect the prices in the two, two areas. Uh, under scenario two, uh, where all this incremental uh, FSU oil goes to uh, Asia, there you see that um, the um, uh, shares of the uh, Saudis in the two markets get very close. And I don't know if I, I may have sk skimmed over this uh, point early on, but the ability to price discriminate is not only that you can uh, put a specific price on barrels depending on where they go and prevent the, uh, the resale or the arbitrage, um, you do want a situation where you're um, 
elasticity of demand for your oil in the two markets uh, differs. And, um, you know, depending on what assumptions you want to make about uh, the two markets, um, uh, one of the factors which determines the elasticity of demand for Saudi oil, that is to say the sensitivity of demand for Saudi oil to its price, is the share of the Saudis in that market. And so as the uh, shares in the two markets um, come together, if all other factors are the same, uh, then the ability to uh, discriminate, of course, will, will, uh, will disappear. Uh, however, even for this small difference in uh, market shares, uh, you can show that um, the Saudis would indeed find it profitable to price discriminate. Um, <clears throat> the most uh, reasonable scenario where we sort of split the difference, 2 million barrels goes to Asia, 2 million barrels goes westward. There you can see that the uh, Saudi share will continue to be where it is today. The European share will, will diminish. Um, the the, um, so the conclusion here is that uh, under any of these scenarios, it would appear that the Saudi's ability to maintain this price discrimination will continue. Um, what can the Saudis do? After all, this, uh, this discrimination, somebody's estimated costs the Asian economy something like $5 billion a year, extra they pay for their oil, as opposed to what they would have to pay if indeed all oil leaving Saudi Arabia was priced at the same amount. Uh, the impact for the Saudi, uh, for the uh, Asian economies is probably even larger than that because, of course, uh, LNG and coal contracts are all tied um, to the price of oil. So if the price of oil is artificially high, then so is the price of those other uh, energy sources. So what can be done? Well, ultimately, it seems to me, the thing that the uh, Asian countries have to do is to get together and end destination pricing. That's the gizmo, that's the, the trick. That's the, um, the device that the Saudis have uh, to maintain this differential pricing. How they can end destination pricing, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly, one can uh, use international organizations and challenge this as sort of somehow there's as, as an illegal um, monopolistic practice. Uh, but uh, given the current uh, situation in the oil market where <laughs> supplies in so many places are so, uh, so, so tenuous, uh, it may be uh, rather risky to, um, to take them on at this particular time. So anyway, but that is, it seems to me ultimately that's what the Asian countries have to do is to get together, act in a coordinated way. It would be best if they acted in a coordinated way with other countries as well and challenge the, the Saudi practice and try to end that, that uh, destination pricing. The other uh, way is to try even further to reduce the, the uh, market uh, for oil in the Asian market and reduce the Saudi share to the point where they really lose the ability to um, uh, maintain, or lose not the ability, but the profitability or uh, motivation for maintaining the price uh, differentials. And I've listed here several of sort of obvious uh, things that they can do. Uh, I just um, highlight two. One is, of course, uh, conservation uh, energy efficiency, particularly in the transportation sector, uh, with China uh, growing so rapidly and the demand for automobiles there growing as rapidly as we read about. Uh, China, because of the previous communist regime, has a fairly low um, saturation of automobile uh, ownership much below what other countries in that same sort of income class would have. So they're, they're not only growing rapidly and wanting to buy cars very rapidly, they're also playing catch up, two things that are increasing the um, demand for automobiles. Uh, it's sort of a shame in a way that they are um, building factories which are building conventional cars uh, when the uh, hybrid, the, the gas, uh, diesel hybrid electric cars uh, that technology is available. It would be a good idea from uh, the Asian 
consumer's point of view if they uh, took this opportunity to introduce that technology as quickly as possible, because once, of course, you build up a stock of conventional cars, then it takes a much longer time to, uh, to convert to more fuel-efficient automobiles, because you have to wear, wait for those older cars to uh, wear out. So in some sense, by doing it now, before China has really accumulated that uh, stock of cars, would be a great idea. Um, Interfuel competition, of course, is, is obvious, um, uh, and, and, and clean coal technology in particular, because India and, and China both have vast uh, reserves of coal. Um, if the Asians could somehow or other reduce the growth in demand in this period from the, uh, say, 2000, 2010, from the 7 million barrels per day, which was projected by the EIA, by 1 million barrels a day to say to 6, uh, it could actually uh, sufficiently reduce the share of the Saudis in the market uh, so that, in fact, the motivation for maintaining the um, price discrimination would, in fact, end. Um, we haven't looked to see how easy it would be, of course, for Asia to uh, achieve that goal. Once you get uh, beyond the 2010, uh, looking further on, as the earlier figures show, uh, the Middle East becomes an even more important uh, supplier of incremental supply. The Asian and European markets will both become much more dependent on uh, the Middle East and, as a result, Saudi. And so from the longer term, term point of view, it doesn't look as if, um, it seems that the Saudis will indeed have the motivation and uh, if destination pricing continues, the ability to maintain this dual price uh, structure. So uh, on that, I will conclude. The more details are in the paper. Okay. Thanks very much. Do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Looking at the three scenarios that you put up on the screen, how, it would, how might the new oil from, from the Soviet Union find its way to Asia? Well, at least this morning we had these discussions of the, the pipeline to uh, the Pacific, to Russia, yeah, the pipeline to Dutch Jane. If the scenario calls for the time period 2010, and those pipelines won't be built. Right, right. no, the, uh, the, the, I have that, the, the uh, data is broken into that period because of the way the IEA is presenting it, but obviously things don't just, there's not a yeah. break, so but you guys are really So I, I would say this period really is like 2008, between 2015, okay. 16, okay. somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, yeah, and you're absolutely right, because in fact, sure. in the paper we talk about the NG uh, gas and liquids from uh, Oman, and that's yeah. Yeah. 2012. Yeah. And also, uh, we made the point in the paper that there's this really short window. In other words, if the East Siberian pipeline gets delayed, right, uh, then uh, maybe by then we uh, you know, it's all because of the contingent on the Iraqis being able to produce more oil. But right. there's going to be this very narrow window where demand is going to be low enough. If the Russian oil came in in that window, it might have an impact. But beyond that window, if they miss the window because the pipeline politics takes longer, mm -hmm. then the Asia premium is going to be really ensconced. And, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we took very extreme assumptions. I think that part of why it is unlikely. <laughs> okay. um, because the, the assumptions we had to make to get even yeah. Possibility of just devastating. Yeah. Yes. Uh, could you just kind of go back in the, the historical route to which the Saudis came to this position? I, I can't yeah. imagine them starting off ground zero saying we're going to charge the agents right. more money. Uh, Amy probably knows this a little bit better than I do. So it does go back to around the late um, 1980s when they instituted a new pricing formula. Uh, and I think over time they suddenly realized that, I'm sure they just experienced, you can talk about how the formula machine does or not, knows that, but, but uh, over time uh, they realized that, uh, you know, they, they could do it, right? It was, uh, in fact, I've talked to someone who worked for the Saudi Arabian oil company and uh, he confirms that actually it was a learning process, that uh, they had the system in place. The idea was to have a formula, a different formula for each market. U.S., Europe, uh, Europe, and Asia, or East. And the uh, formula has something to do with you tie your, your, uh, your price in each of these 
shouldn't say in each of these markets, you tie the FOB price for delivery in each of those markets to some marker fuel price, and then there is some adjustment. And the adjustment was to account for quality differences, transport, sometimes transportation differences, because they wanted to uh, subsidize oil going to lower the price of oil to the United States by helping offset some of the transportation costs. But that um, uh, adjustment factor could, is also somewhat arbitrary, right? I mean, it wasn't, they didn't have a, a formula which had to be applied. Uh, it was applied, I think, primarily in the uh, U.S. and European delivery situations. But in the Asian, for the Asian market, there was an element of arbitrariness where they could make that adjustment <coughs> higher. And, yeah, I don't think they start, didn't start off this, this way, but I think very quickly they realized that they had this ability to, to uh, arbitrarily raise the price for the Asian delivery, and they did. Was it because and it's persisted, as we see now, it's well, persisted for over... Were they only an alternative source? I mean, for I think incremental growth? What, what happened to them, and you can thank the U.S. government, Candy's gone now so I can say this, is originally they, did, they didn't have that ability. Originally what they wound up having was competition from Mexico and Venezuela in the U.S. market, so they gave a shipping discount so they could be beat or be competitive with the Mexicans. Then what happened over time is U.S. sanctions were imposed. There was no alternative supply for Asia. The marginal barrel, right, couldn't come from the Middle East anymore because it was sort of locked up and the, we didn't have a lot of growth because of sanctions. So if an Asian refiner needed an extra barrel beyond which they were going to get from Saudi Arabia, they had to buy it from, say, Nigeria or the North Sea. And that had such a premium on it. Right, that the Saudis were competing with a much higher cost last barrel, right? And I think that when the people in Aramco, we've talked to them, when they realized that they had that situation on their hands, they realized that they might as well price at the cost. They'll capture it, capture it, right? Capture that price. Right. Clearly, uh, clearly, the sanctions on both Iraq <laughs> and Iran played a very, very big role, right? right. Because uh, capacity was held down. Took them out of the game. Yeah, right. and if they had, if there had been no sanctions, this might not have happened because they would. Have competition. It's interesting to note that over the past year, the amount of oil sold by the Saudi Arabia to the United States has dropped rather dramatically, with that oil being redirected to to um, Asia. to to Asia market. You know, which means in part because they could, you know, they're selling us at a discount of what thirty-five cents a right. barrel, they get another buck, in, and so you go right. where, you, where your return is a high. Right. right. Okay, well that's, uh, uh, we thank you and uh, thanks for a great program today and all your participation and questions from the audience. It's okay. Um, just a few little housekeeping items. Um, uh, because of the subject matter, all of our authors had to revise and so not every single paper is, uh, is he available here today, uh, partly because the politics of all these issues have been moving around so much and put us all under great strain, all of our writers. So, uh, but we will have all the papers up on the website in the next week or so, maybe two weeks. Uh, the slides as well? Slides as well. And um, if you just, the website is www.rice.edu backslash energy. And um, you can get to it. We're, we're very multi-dimensional. We have a good web designer. Our webmaster, Christina Estrada, does a good job. So you can, you can either come in through the event, and then where the event uh, program is, you'll be able to click uh, on the speakers and get the slides, or there'll be a big posting and publications of the whole study. And uh, uh, we thank all the uh, uh, researchers. They really brought uh, uh, the, the issues to life today, and the papers are even much more lively and detailed, so I encourage those of you who are readers to really uh, take the time to sift through them because there's a lot of tremendous material there that really couldn't be uh, verbalized over the course of a day. So uh, thank you very much. A little uh, announcement for our, our uh, researcher guests. The, uh, hopefully the shuttle bus is still there uh, out in front of the Institute to take you back to uh, the Hilton. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.